Welcome to Night Shadows. I'm Stuart Best. Where the paranormal is normal. Where that which you thought you knew, you didn't. And where the future can be known, if you know exactly where to look. Welcome to tonight's show. We have scientist Stan Day on with us. We're very happy to have him come on board. Hi, Stan. How are you doing? Uh, Pretty good, Stuart. Uh, You know, for an old guy. (laughs) (laughs) I think we're all getting old. And Larry Taylor, our guest. How are you doing, Larry? Oh, I'm I'm feeling better and and doing better. Thank you very much. Glad to have Stan on tonight. I've, I've been missing Stan a little bit. Well, I Thanks, think this is going to be a bang-up bang show because we need people like Stan to straighten us out on a few things. There's a lot going on, and I wanted to talk maybe a little bit. Did you guys see this new Lloyd's of London report that just came out? What and was it about? it's kind of interesting. The title of it is Political Violence Contagion. Society and Security, a Framework for Understanding the Emergence and the Spread of Civil Unrest. I guess my question to both of you would be, why now? <laughs> um, not having seen the report, I don't know, Stuart, sorry. I haven't seen the well, report, just, sir. Yeah, I think, though, that... Uh, uh, this fit, would fit a little bit into the program. You know, you talk about something you dealt with years ago, Stuart, and I know Stan's aware of his uh, report on Iron Mountain, uh, but this yes. would fit in with the where we're going. Yeah, I mean, it seems odd to me that we have all these reports. I want to get into this with Stan because he's done some a lot of work on, on this sort of thing. Uh, the arrival of uh, Planet X and also the arrival of the Fallen Ones. And this, of course, report may be due to possible economic collapse, or it may be, as some of the people said, that Jade Helm actually had direct ties into the arrival. And um, I don't know where do where. where where do we start with this thing? And then we got this mess over in Israel where the Golan Heights are coming back into play, and it's kind of deadly, it sounds like to me. So, Stan, what have you, have you got something special on your mind you'd like to, or heart that you'd like to push out there? Oh, gosh, there's so much happening now that uh, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, certainly the Golan Heights issue with oil and with uh Putin and the various allies that Russia has and uh, with Saudi Arabia, they're, they're trying to cut off a strategic supply of oil to Israel. I noticed last week in the news that um, the Israeli government is offering um, oh, um, rate cuts and stuff to people who will switch their factories there in Israel from uh, oil, <coughs> excuse me, oil for energy to natural gas which they have plenty of in their wells in the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. The problem is, with uh, the oil wells out in the Mediterranean, it's very hard to defend those, or sorry, the gas wells, very hard to defend those from submarine surface attack from terrorism. And in the Golan Heights, where this AFEC oil uh, well series is, it's also very difficult to defend that because they're so close to ground troops that are ISIS, uh, uh, that are Syrian, that are Russian, uh, you know, all the bad guys in Turkish, that uh, a ground attack and even a low-level, you know, um, Tomahawk missile-type attack could wipe out their access to the oil there in the Golan Heights. And it's a big field down there uh, underneath. There's a lot of oil. So strategically, it's a bad location for them to have the oil that they would be depending on in the event of a crisis. Now, Zion Oil is... Uh, been given permits and they're starting to drill and explore over in the um, um, oh the uh, northern part of Israel. I'm just trying to remember the name of the of the suburb, but anyway, it's um, oh uh, Nazareth. Uh, yeah, Nazareth. It's in the southern part of Nazareth, which is also close to 
uh, occupied territory by the Palestinians. <laughs> so <laughs> wherever they so, turn, they're in trouble. Okay, so you you would think isn't isn't there some commentary out there that Israel is actually sitting on one of the world's greatest supplies of yes, not only and, oil but mineral wealth? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a number of, of very valuable treasures they've got. The ideal situation for their oil would be to have something closer to Haifa, where they have a refinery there, a large refinery, and uh, where they could protect it on land better than they could at sea or in the Golan Heights, because they, they could set up, if they haven't already, surface-to-air missile interceptors and Iron Dome-type stuff to stop air attacks. And, of course, it's you know right, right close to the um, Valley of Megiddo, where the Armageddon conflict is going to take place. Now, now I think that the Armageddon conflict is going to take place in the Megiddo Valley because the invading forces are going to want to take the oil that's going to be uncovered there. Now, my dad was a petroleum engineer, so I picked up a bit of his stuff, uh, his knowledge and uh, for hunting for oil and stuff like that before he passed. Um, he, uh, he was a firm believer that there was a big oil field there in Israel. Now, a number of rabbis that I've studied with over the years have told me that they are aware of a very deep, I mean like five mile deep oil field in Israel. Now they didn't say where, they kind of hinted, and I, I think I found it uh, in the interim. Uh, it's down, it's not quite as deep as they thought, but um, it's, there are two like underground valleys, if you wish, which can contain, and I think do contain, lots and lots, you know, billions of barrels of oil. Now, the Arabs are aware of the threat from Israel to having a deep oil uh, source. And behind-the-scenes talk, gosh, 20 years ago, was that uh, from the Arabs to the Israelis, if you tap that source and start to bring that oil up, it'll be a declaration of war from us or to us because the Arab oil, you know, OPEC Arab groups, their oil comes from shallower wells than, you know, 5,000 feet or 50,000 feet or whatever down. And they said, since our wells are up at the top, you'll be draining oil from them into your oil field. You'll be stealing our oil. And the, and the Israelis said, no, whoa, wait a minute. Let's look at this logically. The oil down there, wherever it is, if it is, you know, quote, quote, uh, will be under pressure. It, the pressure down that deep will put tremendous pressure on the oil reser- reservoir, and it'll be pushing the oil uphill into your Arab wells, and you are actually stealing our oil. Now, you can see this is a no-win situation, but that's what the story between them is behind the scenes. So the Israelis have been reluctant to just leap out and start uh, developing that reservoir, uh, considering that they, they know where it is, because of this threat of immediate war from the richer Arab nations around them. Now, I did a lot of study on this uh, earlier in the year and late last year, and I did track from the AFEC oil field, that's in the Golan Heights. That one there has a lot of oil, and people are all excited about that. But when that was formed, the oil that's underneath Afek went down and across the uh, Sea of Galilee underground and in a, a fissure that goes all the way into northern Israel uh, to the northern western part of the Valley of Megiddo. In fact, it's within 15 miles of the refinery there at Haifa. And I found the stones that the Bible talked about. Um, I did a geological search of all of Israel looking for this particular kind of stone that would be over, uh, like covering the location of the oil reservoir. And I was able, with very poor resolution maps, because they're not making a lot of this stuff public for obvious reasons, I did find at a university there in Israel this map that showed these particular kind of basaltic stones and there's only two locations above ground that that uh, have been detected. And they are right over the top of this deep reservoir that I can see in the uh, um, the, uh, the ground imaging systems they use to see what's underneath, you know, where they set detonations okay. off and they do an image. So I know there are two of these, one on, on the eastern, southeastern side of a range of mountains just, you know, close to Haifa, and the other on the other side. And both of them are in the toe of Asher, where the oil, mm. 
Okay? So I, oh. I've sent this to the prime minister. I've sent it to a couple of the universities and people involved, and didn't expect an answer. I said, but here's what I found. And if you haven't found it yet, please look there, because the Bible says that you'll find oil there. And uh, so I've done my part uh, to locate the strategic huge oil field that uh, I think Israel is sitting on top of. So this would be a good reason then to uh, for them to Syria to snatch to go on if they can get it. When yeah, they- a very good reason. And uh, uh, the Israelis aren't stupid by any means, and I'm sure they're aware of how far out they're hanging, you know, their backside there, depending on oil in the Golan Heights because of all of the surrounding enemies that are on the ground and within one-hour drive with troops, tanks, and nasty things to destroy or take over their oil field there. Um, so, yeah, they're, I'm, they're aware of it, and they, they have made provisions, I'm sure, to um, uh, solve the problem, even to the point of getting oil reserves from other countries through intermediary countries. They're doing that now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, this is interesting. It's from Debka Files. Netanyahu in defense of the Golan. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced he will convene the next cabinet meeting, April 17th, so it's already in progress or, or passed, in the Golan Heights. Netanyahu is also scheduled to meet President Putin, April 21, in Moscow. The meeting will be the opening shot of one of the most crucial battles Israel will face in the next decade to battle over the Golan Heights. Then in the next little note they have, Netanyahu Kerry have tense discussion regarding the Golan. Debka file sources report Sunday that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu called U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry April 13th and asked him whether he seriously believes that the most urgent issue concerning Syria is the Israeli Golan Heights. He was referring to a decision by Washington and Moscow to include a clause calling for the return of the Golan to Syria and a draft proposal at the Geneva Talks on Syria's future. What would be your comment on that, either you, Larry, or or Stan? Larry, have a go. Oh, that's I find that incredibly interesting and and. Uh... As a matter of fact, another part of that report also indicates that, uh, you know, and you can't just call it coincidence, uh, that four Israeli fighters flew off of the Mediterranean very close to uh, Russia's Latakia military base, and they sent two two Su-30s, Russian fighters, to meet them, and they were very surprised. And and this occurred just as... uh, Netanyahu was in Moscow beginning to meet with Putin, and uh, I look at it a little bit like maybe a message. Uh, You know, these things don't just happen uh, out of the clear blue skies, you would say, Uh, but it almost sounds like, uh, you know, it was a message from Netanyahu that, you know, we could, uh, we really could defend ourselves. We could defend Israel. We could defend Golan, and and, uh, we could surprise you, And, and this is what's interesting uh, about the time of that meeting in Moscow, the, the next day, uh, actually, uh, there was a report came out indicating a, uh, a deepening rift between Putin and Obama, or, or you could say the U.S. and Russia, over the Syria situation. And uh, it's very interesting how this is woven. Uh, I, I wondered, you know, I talked to you, Stuart, the other day, and I, I kind of brought up a, a or kind of a crazy theory that uh, <laughs> is it possible that uh, actually, you know, and this is something I'd like Stan's opinion on because he knows biblical prophecy and all, but I'm beginning to, to wonder and look at some of the uh, dots that seem to be connecting. And, you know, w- we know there's going to be a biblical invasion of Israel. We know that, and we know some of the characters involved in that. And interestingly, could it really, the spark, be the Golan in, instead of a... And this is what I, I told Stuart, Stan. I, I asked Stuart, I said, this is so interesting the way this thing's getting set up because if by chance, you know, and at the same time we've got reports of Chinese troops beginning to move into Syria. We've got, uh, of course, we've got the Russians there already, and they seem to be reinforcing now. Uh, mm-hmm. when at one time they were withdrawing, and 
you know, I begin to to look at this like kind of odd. Like, is there some kind of scenario we're about to see where, uh, and we know Obama is, you know, everything against Israel, he's for, and and all the plans that Obama has worked has been against Israel uh, with Iran and all for a long, long time. And of course, we've got Iranian troops also under a very close eye friend of yours. Uh, I wouldn't call him a friend, Stan, but Soleimani who I've watched very closely, and it's mysteriously come back out after being wounded, apparently. But I began to think, you know, and I asked Stuart, I said, is it possible that they could move on to Golan to try to take, in in other words, not politically, but militarily, begin to force Israel off the Golan, and then Israel's response, the response from Israel is more than expected, and actually they have to, they're hooked, and they have to invade Israel because of what has occurred. And it all goes, it all comes off of the Golan, and somewhere we never would have thought there'd been a lot of any kind of big battle over. But I begin to look and talk about the hooks and the jaws, and there's a lot of that, you know, treaties and all these things. But the Golan, though, is somewhere we haven't really noted a place where a big war would start, but it is possible. Well, it's a very complex issue in the Middle East about uh, the alliances being formed uh, at present, as uh, Saudi Arabia is probably the one to watch most of all. Saudi Arabia doesn't like Iran. Saudi Arabia doesn't like ISIS. Saudi Arabia is under the rulership of the Salman uh, family, of the um, Saud family. And um, the king, King uh, Salman at the moment, um, has a um, a cousin who's going to take over from him, and that's uh, Mohammed bin Nayef. Uh, they shorten his name in the in the area to MBN. And the deputy uh, crown prince is King Salman's son, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Now, Mohammed bin Salman is gaining favor, in my opinion, over um, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general. Because this young prince, 31 years old, he's a handsome fella, he's rich out the wazoo, he's a little bit careless in what he, how he handles his military affairs at the moment, but that's his portfolio. And he has now formed a consortium, um, a confederation loosely put together of 39 Arab countries. Now, this is an Arabic union. He's got a lot of clout by doing that. And they've run uh, joint exercises, military exercises in Saudi Arabia with these groups, getting ready to move into the Syrian situation and to take down Iran at the same time. This guy, this young prince, is he, he will qualify since he won't be the king. He, he's the, the, still be the prince in line after um, uh, Mohammed bin Nayef. This young prince will probably make a a treaty with Israel and the many nations that he's pulling together, probably in the Arab Consortium, for peace after something big happens that, you know, Israel comes through and the world is afraid of Israel. I think, uh, Larry, what you were saying is probably true. Israelis are going to use some of their secret technology, some nasties, and it'll scare the heck out of everybody in the world. And so this young prince, uh, Salman, will ratify that um, that treaty, a covenant between Israel and the many nations, um, after this happens. Now, he won't make, the the, the young prince won't make the, the covenant, but he will ratify it on behalf of the consortium. Now, I know that people don't like looking at Nostradamus as a reliable prophet, but there is one thing that leapt out at me when I was reading what uh, this young prince Salman is doing. He, he, Salman, by the way, is uh, the Arabic form of what we call Solomon. And oh. the, 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 the verses in the Revelation of John do point to, here is wisdom. And they say it's the number of a man and the number is 666. Well, everybody's thinking, okay, you count up his letters of his name in this language or that. When you add it up and it gets 666, that's got to be the guy. What was being said there was, in this place is wisdom. And the 666 refers to King Solomon and his behavior. He was, uh, he had 666 tons, or um, 
oh, I think it was talents, but anyway, he had 666 of these quantities of gold every year as his income. And the the main places that 666 are mentioned, there's two of them, were both to King Solomon and the, the amount of gold that he received. Now, he was thought to be a wise, very wise, the wisest king. Here wisdom is. Go look at King Solomon. There's a clue. Going back to Nostradamus. Nostradamus hmm. says the Antichrist of this age will be called Mabus, M-A-B-U-S. And okay. as sure as I sit here, I have read a number of news articles in Saudi Arabia in the last year where they refer to young Prince Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, as M-B-S to differentiate him from the crown prince, Mohammed bin Nayef, M-B-N. So what does this mean? How does that fit with Mabus? Well, Mabus is M-B-S as consonants. There are two vowels in there, two vowels, A and U. What is young Prince Solomon doing? He is forming an Arabic union, M-A-B-U-S. And if that doesn't make the hair in the back of your neck stand up, I don't know what will. He has got money. He's selling off a large chunk of the uh, Arab American, the Aramco oil company, and he's going to turn that back into his country for various means. But it's a huge amount of money. He has got money and power. And the throne in Saudi Arabia has been telling Obama what to do since he got office. Yes. Um, he, I mean, he, he bowed down to those turkeys. You know, I could not believe my <laughs> eyes. Yes. Now, here is something, guys, that, that I, I only uh, leaked out publicly this week in one place in a, in a little show I was doing. And that is this. You, you know that I used to work for Dr. Teller's group down in Australia. What you mm-hmm. may not have heard... Uh, it's certainly not publicly for me, was that we had a base, a, a research base with flying saucers, etc., in Saudi Arabia, 120 miles outside of Riyadh in what's called the Jabal Tuwaik mountain range. That, oh. base, uh, that base was so secret that if you approached, other than in one of our craft and, and with a scheduled visit, you were shot down and killed. There's no questions asked, no IDs looked for, you were just killed. Now, it is that strip of land in Google Earth Maps of Saudi Arabia, that strip of land has only low-resolution, highly pixelated images available to the public. They're hiding what the fallen ones, and you know they, they are there, were doing and are doing in the base there. Now, how's that for a so, speech? So, wow, that's so, a shocker. Yeah, so that's their, that's their Area 51. Or Dream it Lake, is. or what Dream Lake? Yeah, it is, and uh, I think that now. Now here's another thing that I will, I'll be releasing, you know, in a major um, lecture in in July there in Colorado Springs. I found Atlantis, and this is no joke. It is part of the Genesis six story. It Atlantis existed after Genesis. They they landed, the, the fallen ones came, the angels came, and they bred with our women, just like in Genesis 6, and they made hybrids, Nephilim. Now, yes. Atlantis was not a little island. It was a dirty, big island. And Plato mm. told us, I've been following his instructions step by step, because I found what destroyed Atlantis and what caused the great flood of Noah all at the same time. Atlantis, the main island, the whole island, not the capital in that little circles that, uh, that Poseidon set up, the whole island was 1.3 million square miles. And the, if the Plato account said it is as big as the area of ancient Libya and uh, ancient um, Asia Minor. Now, that was part of wow. Greece. And, and, right. Now, the, the, the area of those two is 1.3 million miles, so it's around that size, right? So the only thing that was that size, and it used to be an island before the flood, was the Arabian Peninsula. So I started looking, and I found uh, the, the, the fertile plain that Plato mentioned that was in the Atlantis. I found that. It's 110 miles by 330 miles. It's a rectangular plain. It's there in the mud map I got from NASA. I found over 1,700 stone um, uh, like monuments and things that the, the Atlanteans left. I found wow. where the giants in King in in Og in Bashan, up near uh, the Glen Heights in the Glen Heights, where they left a circle 
uh, of stones, uh, several circles, all around the center of the, the thing, which was a mud map of what the capital of Atlantis looked like. And I found a number of these same kind of symbols in stone down in uh, northwestern uh, Arabia. Um, you know, uh, I even found what might be called their version of the Nazca lines, but they are rectangular formations over an area of about 50 square miles in Arabia. So they are, they're, they're coming back. Uh, the, the Sumerian gods are really the fallen ones that were there. And I suspect that this is how the Antichrist will get his help from an alien god, because they're camped right there in his country. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Wow. So that's, that's why they are there, then. That's yes. why you have that secret base there. Yes. Amazing. Absolutely. Now, so that, the, that yeah, dovetails into your work that you did on, on Daniel, then, directly. Doesn't Absolutely. It? Absolutely. Uh, look, I'm just discovering these things now in the last few months, right? Um, and, in fact, probably in the last month, it's gotten even more intense, the things I'm discovering. But, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that when I put all that uh, stuff in Daniel into the book. But it was a prelude to me discovering where Atlantis was and where the Fallen Ones were and are again. <laughs> you don't get many UFO reports out of Saudi Arabia. They keep them quiet, but some do leak out on the Internet. And there are a lot of yeah, reports have... that, yeah, oh, go ahead. They were the, the reports relate to Yemen and up from Yemen up to that base at uh, 120 miles outside of Riyadh. They're coming from that area, so I, I'm telling you, they're there. Wow. Wow. So, you, um, I'm going to tell everybody the book you're referring to, Stan. It's one that Stan Dale wrote, and it's called The Cosmic Conspiracy. And you got to take a look at what he has come up with as he researched the ancient languages. Page 265, 266 uh, are just stunning. Uh, let me read you just a short paragraph. Daniel is warning of the coming world kingdoms in which some of the ten regions controlled by immortal beings from the heavens. Well, there's, <laughs> they're here. They're here. Yeah. Already. You know, look, I have discovered, or the Lord has led me to discover, let me put it that way, because I'm just a, you know, a student, but he's led me to discover what caused the great flood. And, you know, uh, Morris and a lot of other people have said that there was a catastrophic event that caused the the fountains of the deep, you know, the under ocean to erupt into the mm -hmm. surface and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but they don't know what the, the thing was. Now, some people say, oh, Planet X, this and that. It was not. It was a meteor that was 22 times the energy of the Chicxulub meteor that made the Gulf of Mexico. And I found its impact crater today. And the, the uh, volcanologists and, and uh, geologists in this country that, where it landed have been trying to explain the part of this crater that's on land and you know, the rest of it's underneath the ocean. And they thought it was what they called Earth subsidence, that it just collapsed into a perfect circle impact crater 300 miles in diameter. 300 miles in diameter. Now, that crater was made by a meteor that impacted the east coast of India. And if mm. you look at the, at the Indian map, you'll see on the, the, you know, the right side of it, if you're looking at it, you'll see what's called the Kudapa, C-U-D-D-A-P-A-H, Kudapa Basin, and they're, they're trying to prove that it was a volcano. They think it must have been. Well, it was. And if you, well, let's see. Are you guys near your computers at all? Yes, uh, I'm not. Looking right at one. <laughs> okay. Um, go to uh, standeo.com and click on our show images page. Let me just see what it looks like there, and I'll tell you. Um if you go to standale.com, you'll see a bunch of books and stuff up there. Uh, and scroll down under the pictures of the books, and you'll see a big sign that says YouTube. And down underneath that, in blue, it'll say Show Images. Click on that, and you'll see what I was talking about this morning. Um, okay. Now, it, um, now scroll down to what now? At, okay, did you scroll down to Show Images in blue underneath the, the, the YouTube sign? No, I'm on your front page here right now. 
Okay, on the front page. Yeah. Uh, do you see the pictures of books? No. What are, what well, are you looking at with? Are you looking at it with an iPad or something, or are you looking at it with a computer? No, it's a regular desktop. It says standale.com. And okay, all and the do you books see? are up on top, right? I got those. Right. Okay, well, just at the right end of the books and just down about, you know, half an inch. Oh, I see it. Okay. That, you see underneath YouTube? that YouTube sign that says show images? Yes. Click on that. Okay, got it. On the first image in the top row on the left-hand side, click on that. First image, top-hand row. Okay. Now, tell me when you're there. Uh, is this the Solomon Red Saucers final thing? No, no, no. What did you click on? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, let's um, see. Well, at uh, the very top, at the very top of the show images page, what does it say? What in yellow? What does it say? I don't have any yellow on this one at all. It's just got your picture on it. Stan Dale, subscribe. Uh, this is your YouTube subscribe. channel. Is that the right one? No. Yeah, you don't want to go to YouTube. You want to go underneath it to where that little oh. microphone is to the right of that where it says show images. Okay. Okay. I'm probably talking too fast because I'm hyped up about all this. Well, Sorry. I'm kind of dumb when it comes to that sort of thing. Nah. Okay, show images. I got it. <laughs> okay. Get over okay, to show images it. and tell me when you see it there. Okay, I got show images. This and you see right the top row one. is a picture of Earth? Yep. Okay, click on that yep. picture. Okay, now. The Kudapa Crater is on the eastern coast of India. And you can see India, it's uh, underneath that little red circle with the arrow pointing to it. Yes. Yep. And if you look down in the in the ocean at the little wrinkles in the ocean between India and Saudi Arabia and Africa, you'll see where India used to be connected to uh, Africa and oh, Saudi yeah. Arabia. You see that? Yes. Now, Yes. Look very carefully at that little image down there, at that little little kind of uh, wrinkle in the ocean bottom, and you'll see that at that time, India had a concave structure, like you know, on its west coast, it bent in toward the right. But yes. when the crater hit, it hit uh, just, uh, I'll show you in another picture in a minute where it hit, right underneath Ceylon, or, 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 you know, today, at the very southern tip of India, it hit, <clears throat> excuse me, there, when India was still connected to Saudi Arabia and Africa, it dived oh. down underneath. It was a very uh, shallow impact. It didn't go straight down. It went sideways into the Earth's surface. And it made a splash as it dived under India, which pushed India clear up to make the Himalaya Mountains. And it turned the West Coast from being concave to convex, pointing to the left. Yes, wow. yes India. I see that. Yeah. Now, you got to get on Google Earth or Maps or whatever you can later in your own time and look at the Kudapa Crater. Uh, it is so obvious that it is an impact. It's no wonder that they couldn't figure out, you know, um, how to prove it because they weren't allowing for India to have been shoved away from the point where it actually impacted India. Now, hmm. it it hit, it went underneath India, and it broke its craton, which is the, the pillar that the continent of uh, India and, and, and all that Asian part. It's the pillar of hard kimberlite type stone that's underneath most of the continents, and it's called the craton. Well, it pushed its craton away from the Indian Ocean, which it formed, pushed it underneath Saudi Arabia, underneath Europe, and out into the North Atlantic, where you see Atlantic bulge. I see that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see it. That, and I'll, I'll prove that to you in a second. The the big Atlantic bulge, if you go to the North Atlantic, it's over 2.3 million square miles of, of seafloor that's been raised up from the impact of the, Chicxul of the Kudapa crater over in India, which caused the flood. This broke up the fountains of the deep. This broke up, you know, within 100 years, the, the, the continents that were Pangaea broke them all apart in the time of Peleg. This yes, is sir. what happened. Do you see wow. that? Yeah, and the North so Pole used obvious. to Oh, it's going to get Bobby more obvious than that in a minute. Oh, yeah. The the original North Pole was in Iceland. You see that yellow arrow pointing down? It used yep. to be what we was our North Pole. So even oh. in finding Atlantis and, and the Garden of Eden, I had to put the planet straight up so that Iceland was the North Pole to find these things. And mm. uh, 
there's a difference of 23 and a half degrees between where it used to be and where it is now. That was caused by the impact of the Cotopa Crater meteor. Wow. Now, let me tell you also, when it dived underneath India, it it lowered the right-hand side, the um, eastern side of Saudi Arabia. It lowered it down and raised up the top part of it as it traveled underneath, pushing mass ahead of it. Now, if we go back to the – just use your back arrow and go back to the show images page. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. in the top row, on the right-hand side, there's a rainbow-looking picture of the Earth's yes. surface. Okay, yep. that's from NASA. Now, what this map tells us is the, how the, the Earth's perfect sphere, if you wish, is not perfect, how it's uh, got uh, hills and valleys, if you wish, from what they measure from the satellites, from the mass you know, the gravitational right. field of the, of the Earth. And if you look right where India is on the left, and that purple thing, that okay. shows that it's missing a lot of mass. It's a, the lowest mass con uh, on the planet. And if you follow uh, upper left going toward Europe, and it comes out on the right-hand side there, where did the mass go? Over into the North Atlantic and into Iceland. Do you see that? Yeah. It's orange. It pushed all that matter over there. It pushed wow. down Saudi Arabia. See, it's kind of bluish. But on the top end of it, it got kind of reddish or yellowish and greenish as it raised up the top end of uh, the Saudi Peninsula or the Arab uh, Peninsula. At that time, it was an island. The Mediterranean flowed straight into the Persian Gulf, and it was a, it, there was a sea there, and the Red Sea s- surrounded on the west side of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So mm-hmm. the whole Saudi Peninsula was an island, the island of Atlantis. That sure. had to be destroyed by God, because of all the crossbreeding of the animals and vegetation and people and everything there. Now, going out on a limb, just on a side issue or a rabbit hole, okay. the, the thing that bothers a lot of the rabbis and scholars of the Old Testament, in Genesis in particular, is that giants reappeared, you know, hybrid Nephilim baddies reappeared on the other side of the flood, but they weren't on the ark. Uh-huh. Now, I think from what we've determined in retranslating the, the words they use for the earth, it said, God lifted up the ark above the earth, in English. In Hebrew, yes. it says, it lifted it up above the red dirt. Now, the Arabic uh, peninsula there is red sand. You can see it in the Google Earth oh. maps. The blind Freddy could see mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. It was the, the, the impact of the meteor shoved a tidal wave across the entire planet, rolled around the entire planet, and left rain from the fallout from all the vaporized water from the impact it went up in the stratosphere got cool made rain and from the broken up fountains of the deep flood and it flooded where this depression of mass was so the indian ocean right up into saudi arabia and uh, some of the surrounding areas of, of uh, europe now were all flooded for a year but not the whole planet it didn't get all the baddies so god says to israel as moses uh, takes him in the or joshua takes him into the promised land it says to Joshua, go and kill all the animals, you know, all the children, all the people, everything in this village, because they are part of the hybrid, you know, fallen ones that got through the flood. So God had oh. a cleanup plan. He had a cleanup plan so that they, they wouldn't get away. But you can see now, I, I always wonder, why did God make Joshua, you know, the Israelis just go in there and kill everything in that village or this village? There were several of them that did. Why destroy them all? It's because genetically they were corrupt. Wow. And they would have corrupted the rest of the planet. Yes, eventually. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, the stuff I'm finding here is absolutely making my mind go zap. It's just amazing stuff. Wow. Stan, let me ask you a quick question here. Uh, when that struck, it, apparently what you're, you're describing, and, and I see on your page there, there was a, an incredible redistribution of weight with part of the planet. And I wonder now, after the flood, after this this occurred, is that why now the Earth is tilted at such a strange angle and also a wobble and, and, and the spin has changed and all? Did that do all of that at that time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Wow. I, I even ran experiments with the vectors, you know, the, the impact uh, force of that meteor where it hit and the spin of the Earth at the time and see which way it would tilt the Earth. And uh, it's it. 23 and a half degrees. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, science is going to have to catch up to truth. 
Um, <laughs> They really are, because, and they're starting to. There are several physicists who have published papers and uh, incurred the wrath of the rest of the cosmologists and astrophysicists and whatever. But these guys have come out and said, look, from your own formula and from, like, you know, what Einstein proposed and what uh, subsequent physicists have proposed as the Big Bang, that all the mass, including dark matter, was confined to a little thing, a little pinhead uh, volume, and that was before the universe formed, and it exploded <clears throat> and blew out everything. And they said it took 15 billion years in classical physics. These scientists said, now, wait a minute. Now, you're measuring how old everything is with what they call radiometric dating, which is using the decay rates of, of uh, radioactive isotopes, uh, which depend on the speed of light. It's part of the formula being conscious yes. at the beginning when everything was crammed down and so dense tightly packed something traveled a lot faster electromagnetic waves traveled 10 with 30 zeros after it faster than it does now 10 mm. with 30 zeros now if you look at the similar situation on earth if i speak to you in a room through air my voice my sound waves use the air as the medium like dark matter would be for light and mm -hmm. the sound travels over to you at 1100 feet per second if i were to connect to you with a bar of nickel it would travel to you at 5500 feet per second five times faster because it's more dense mm. because the impact travels through all these tightly packed atoms go back to the universe starting big bang light travels so much faster than Radioactive things decayed so much faster. Everything occurred so much faster that when you apply this curve, it's a what they call a, a, an asymptotic exponential curve. When you apply that to the speed of light and various other things that depend on it, it makes the universe less than 100,000 years old, maybe less than 50,000 years old. Now, isn't that incredible? Wow. Well, that would, uh, yeah, that's so, that would tell a lot of questions because a lot of people, you know, they. They, they just can't believe what Genesis says, and you know, like the Big Bang. If you if you look in, I think it's in Isaiah. He says, "I stretched out the heavens." Well, if he stretched yes. them out, that means it expanded. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, in Revelation it says, "After the thousand year reign, the millennial reign, that the earth and the heavens shall pass away in a great heat, and a new mm -hmm. earth and a new heaven will replace them." Now, we're expanding, and we're going to dissolve. Things are going to break up, and it's not going to be billions of years, like you're saying. It's less, well, it's just a little over a 1,000 years, and this is going to happen. Things happen a lot quicker and more catastrophically than science wants to believe. They want this gradual Darwinian yeah. progress, you know. It just, it, it, they, they just don't open their minds and look for the truth of their scientific findings. No. If the universe is expanding like they're claiming, let's say it started to contract, we wouldn't see that anyway until it got to us, would we? Well, the the Indian philosophers and physicists and astronomers from ages ago said that uh, Brahmins, they were, they said that Brahma sleeps for, what, 100 million years and then Brahma awakes, and they were applying that to the expansion and contraction of the universe. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it would all be relative. Maybe we would uh, uh, not realize it until it got hotter or whatever. But I, I don't think we're going to be here in this form anyway. We'll be in a safe place with the Lord. But, um, yeah. And here's another point on that. You remember when Moses was up on the Mount Sinai talking to God, and he said to God, yes. look, um, can I see what you look like? And God said, oh, yeah, paraphrasing. Look, Moses, um, I, I'd love to. I'll, I'll put my image up on a cloud, and I'll hide you in a safe cleft of the mountain here so you don't get hurt. But my energy is so much greater than yours that my presence would destroy you. Now, that didn't happen in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were walking with God, did it? No. When it Noah change. walked with God. When Noah walked with God, didn't happen then either, did it? No. When Ezekiel saw the flaming chariot, things were getting a bit warmer because the flaming chariot appeared in the sky coming through the veil from God's universe to ours, and it was hot because of its molecules being much more energetic than us. Now then, Moses comes up, and no wonder. 
the difference, the disparity between God's kingdom and our universe is growing greatly. We are like running out of gas compared to him. So you can see these things are hidden in Scripture. Part of the curse, wow. thermodynamics. Yes. yes. Yeah. You're, yeah. It's, we're in complete entropy, running down. There's no isentropy where you're putting stuff back together again. That's what you're talking about for the collection and, and condensing. You know, where the universe shrinks. That would be isentropy, where it takes the energy and puts it back into the system. But right now, we're in entropy, losing everything, just dying. The whole universe. Fascinating. Um, now, when you see these UFO movies, they always have big clouds around them. Is that because they're coming in from a uh, frequency that's lower and it's cooler? Or what is? why are they portraying it that way? Do you well, think? first of all, you're assuming that when they portray these things, they're doing it accurately from you know, real well, evidence. that's true. <laughs> but uh, going back to Ezekiel, and the chariot, it did have a cloud around it as it came into our uh, our world in the upper atmosphere. Um, mm-hmm. The the Shekinah over the um, the Ark of the Covenant did glow, did run out in the street and light up the streets of Israel in the time of Solomon, and there was a cloud that appeared over uh, Israel as they watched, and you know they, it appeared before them. Now there's some argument that the cloud that was a cloud, a pillar of fire in the day and a pillar of smoke at night, might have been the eruption of Mount Sinai over in uh, Arabia, that they were following it as a, as a guide. But if it's not, if it was literally talking about the fire being right there in front of Israel on the ground, or you know close to it anyway, then mm-hmm. this would explain the, the heat, because it was gating in from a parallel universe of much greater energy. Um, the the priests in in the, in the Exodus and, and uh, you know that was the forty years that they were out in the desert when they walked ahead of Israel scorpions noxious things were all killed in the land before Israel walked on it because they took the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them and it sterilized the land it didn't kill the good things but it did kill all the noxious things so there was power coming from God's Ark of the Covenant to our Ark of the Covenant here and doing all the wondrous things that it did. Wow. Well, you know, don't you wish you could just grab people by the neck and get them into a room and say, look at this, look at this, you know? Let's don't argue and fight about this. This is reality. Well, I've often wondered, Stan, when you get, as we get closer to the end, which is getting obvious, it seems like there's more and more people defecting, running from it. Running Less people from are willing what? to look at it. Uh, sorry, they are or are not willing to look at it. Not not willing to look at it, really. Yeah, well, you, you got to see that we've got a majority of our population is in the age of thirty and below, and they are not listening to the wisdom of their elders, and are more interested in texting and whatever else they do with these gadgets, and just don't want to know about it. They they want to give me society, and they're not interested. Can't see a value in it. Well, well. Anyway, getting back to this uh, base, Area Fifty One of Saudi Arabia. Yep. Um, what is your take on this arrival, and how close do you think it really is? Oh, okay. I'll answer that. But first, let me finish answering your question about the the cloud. Um, quite frequently, uh, our craft would be surrounded by um, moisture uh, that condensed or either remained a cloud. And it's because of the uh, the field that sets up actually attracts things around it, and it will they will condense when they get to a certain uh, temperature and certain uh, relative humidity. So yes, it is quite feasible to say that when the electromagnetic or electrogravity craft are stationary, uh, that they will create a cloud around them, and even when they move, the, the cloud will move with them. Um, in fact, in our early tests in the uh, late 50s. Um, they were using not uh, anti-gravity, but they were using um, charged uh, air, plasma air. And they had a, a kind of rubbery seal around the top part of the saucer that caught fire frequently. And when it did, it would put this acrid smoke out, and it wouldn't go anywhere. The stupid smoke would recirculate through the, the drivers and everything, and, and you'd be flying in a black cloud blind. And they'd have to ground the craft and call for help, and someone else have to send another craft over and couple to it and take it to safety. So, yes, clouds do form around these things of all kinds of stuff. Now, 
How close are we? I'd say that the world has to be ready for someone to help them. All religions, uh, all cultures, all status of you know financial well-being or not, all of us are going to want to have this solution. To do that, we have to bring the earth to the brink of destruction by something. Uh, economy, okay. a nuclear war, and that does seem to be a part, a major part of what's going to happen because Israel is going to get blamed for it for sure and there have to be a treaty. So there's going to be a global crisis, financial, physical, uh, militarily, that will make people cry out, give us someone who has the answers and can bring peace at any price. And that's when we will see the unveiling of the world leader with the technology and the help of Satan being named as our elder brother from space or some such rubbish like that. Uh, this has all been laid out, been planned, waiting for the moment, and I would say that that moment is probably within 10 years, maybe less. Yeah, they seem to be moving along pretty fast. Larry, yeah. got any questions? I was, uh, well, something I was wondering about, uh, Stan, I talked to him on an earlier radio show. I don't, Stuart, I don't think you heard it, but... Uh, Stan, you remember we were talking about there was a friend of mine up here lived in Arkansas that uh, heard something down behind his house and went down and it was a flying saucer, a saucer craft. And, uh, you know, I shared with you as he walked towards the craft, the closer he got to it, the more he said time slowed down. And he never did get to the craft because he got scared and he he did take a picture of it. And Stuart had a picture of that craft on his website for a while. I'm not sure where it is now, but he had it up. I still got it. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, uh, But what I was going to ask you, Stan, and you said that made perfect sense. uh, These craft, uh, whoever, you know, is in these craft, the saucer-like craft, uh, they appear to uh, somehow – close in involves space time or, or or affect space time to some degree and I was also wondering one thing that 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 is just a thought and wonder your opinion on it. Inside you know, these craft, you know, is it possible that uh space time is different in well you, I know you said time was different in from inside the craft to that what was outside the craft. There was a difference there. And and I was going to ask you too, if these craft are multidimensional, is it also because there has been reports from a few people that some of these craft, when they get inside them, they're a whole lot bigger than they are on the outside. And I was wondering, is there a multidimensional essence inside these craft that makes the interior of the craft different from what you're looking at on the outside? In other words, could a a ball of light actually be a, almost the city, size of a city inside it. Just a, one, just a thought with the talking about space-time and, and dimensions. All right. Well, first of all, in normal physics, even with the electrogravitic uh, things we've talked about, you would think that such a thing would be impossible unless it were a, a gateway inside of it to, to the parallel universe. It's much like the Doctor Who series on the BBC where his TARDIS time travel thing looked out on the outside like a police call box, and you opened the door and went inside, and it was a huge, multi-leveled uh, you know, dwelling place for the, for the doctor. And uh, I'll admit it, I'm a Doctor Who fan. But um, that kind of a situation could well exist inside one of these craft. Remember, um, the, the, the account of Nimrod building the tower, organizing people who spoke the same language at the time to build this tower up to the heavens, the angelic beings said, let us go down and confuse their language so they can't build that tower and rise up to become as one of us. They were mm-hmm. afraid that we would get out of the crib too early. And that's why they scattered our language and whatever. Now, there was a way for them to gate from Earth at a high place into the next universe. Remember God sat on a mountain for uh, Moses? The yeah. 200 fallen ones went to, to Mount, um, what you call it, uh, Harmon, Harmon? Yeah. Uh, a high place. And it seems that the high places are where they gate in, even in South America and some of the, the ruins they found there where they said the gods came and went. They were high places, mountainous places. Um, mm. Ezekiel's flying, flaming chariot came out of the air. 
Satan is the prince of the air at the moment, the gateway area. Now, he's going to be prohibited, if not already, of returning back to the heavens to challenge uh, people in front, you know, in front of God. He's going to be cast down with his minions here to earth for the last days, and, and he may already be here. But time is an interesting subject, and I'm going to try to explain this simply by saying that time has no real measurement, no seconds, no hours, no days, no Martian days. Uh, it's, it's all relative. And here's what happens. We measure time, let's say, by the tick-tock of a grandfather clock. We measure time mm-hmm. by the vibration of a little silicon uh, quartz, silicon dioxide uh, crystal in a watch, you know, crystal time. We measure time by uh, the oscillations of a cesium atom rising and falling in energy. What happens in every case that we use to measure time? We take a, a, a physical thing, and it changes location or size. In other words, distance is the, the footprint. While um, a cesium atom expanded, you know, a micronats fart big and then collapsed back as it oscillates back and forth. While it did that maybe 50 million times, um, the second hand on our clock, ticked over one second. It moved one second. It's all <laughs> relative. So when you look at, at the motion of things and the density of space and energy, and they're interchangeable, if you're looking at a flying saucer that's using an electrogravitic field, it can alter time inside that field in both directions. It can be less dense than the air and, and, and dirt around it, or it can be more dense. And depending upon which one it is, time will either um, contract or expand. In other words, things will pass either slower or faster inside the craft, depending upon which density you've chosen relative to the outside. So when your guy was walking toward it and things slowed down, um, that tells you that as the energy got more dense in the craft, because it was you know charged up, it had been up and was settled and maybe about to take off, The air, the dirt, and everything within that field was more dense, had more energy. So that's used by the the, the saucer pilots when they want to turn a corner at 20,000 miles an hour. Instead of doing it in, you know, a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second, which would have just destroyed the craft and the crew from G-forces, they pump the energy into the crew and the craft, make them very dense. And to the crew, it's like your friend walking up toward the, the craft. Things slow down. And they look out the window, uh, or you know, the viewport, whatever they've got, and they look at people on the outside, and everybody outside there um, goes into slow motion, if not almost stopping, while the occupants oh. inside the craft play cards, have a cup of tea, whatever, turn the corner and take <laughs> 10,000 times longer to turn that corner than what your, you, your eye sees in a blink of a second. And wow. that's why you see the, the brilliant flash as they turn a right-angle corner at high speed. It's discharging the energy they piled into it before the turn. It all makes sense if you stop and think about it later. So that's that's how time is altered. Is the uh, it, it's a it's a pure ratio of how far this moved in the time that that moved that far. Okay, it's a length and it's a pure dimensionless ratio. Hmm. So I don't know if you saw the uh, video some kid took, but you see these two aliens walking around outside the craft. They're very tall, spindly-looking things. Uh, they see the kid who's videotaping them, and they run, and they get in this craft. It, it, it leaves, and then you see this portal open up, and a, there's a giant flash, and the thing is gone. Was that now, the one where it, was that the one where it was, the saucer was kind of uh, on the ground, and there's a little hill between the, the guy videoing yes. it and them? Yeah, I saw that. I think I've got it actually. Yeah. I mean, um, they must have gateways, you know, straight away, or either they went so fast that it looked like they disappeared through a, a portal. I don't know. But, um, but you, do you think up, that was authentic? I always thought that that was authentic because, you know, the kid drops his camera <laughs> screaming for his mother, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, computer graphics make it uh, fairly easy these days to fool us, but um, I couldn't yeah. see anything wrong with it. I mean, uh, as far as I could tell, it could very well have been real. Uh, mechanically, physics-wise, I, I couldn't fault it. Well, I, have a, I it. have a story. Yeah. Larry, you got any questions there? 
No, I'm fascinated. I'm I'm still uh <laughs> I'm still watching digesting that, I'm still watching that you that saucer craft make that quick turn and disappear. <laughs> Stan is that why a lot of people a lot of sightings, uh they report that they're they see something moving around in the sky and then it's bright and all of a sudden there's a flash and it's gone, completely vanished. Is that why a lot of times they it's not it gone, it just went somewhere else. I think so. Uh, some of the footage that I've seen that I think is authentic, when you do it frame by frame, you'll catch a portion of that craft as it blinks out uh, in mm. the next frame, as though it were moving. Um, but I'm not against the, the, the theory that, or hypothesis anyway, that uh, something like that can open a portal and uh, you know go into the parallel universe, you know, and then back out somewhere else. It. Uh, there's so much we're we're just now starting to scratch the surface of and to understand how God works everything, at least at our level, anyhow. What's your take on Bob Lazar mm. and his Area 51 experience, Stan? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I've talked to Bob, and, and I've seen a lot of tapes and talked to... Uh, George Knapp, who uh, discovered Bob, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, let's say that the the way Bob described the um, anti-gravity uh, field inside the little scout craft, or what he called it, doesn't exactly jive with how we did ours. Uh, we didn't have um, three pods to make you know gravity waves to lift us up or anything. We actually generated a field around the entire craft, uh, and the the fallen ones uh, did the same thing, as far as I know. The, the reason to have three anythings on either a plasma craft or anti gravity craft, three uh, balls, three uh, pointy things, whatever, three three sided uh, triangular shaped craft, is you need to have three points having energy to drive the craft. Those three points, you you can lower the energy on one point or two or three, whatever, and it will cause the ship to turn. It's called uh, making a plane. In, in plane geometry, you have to have three points to determine a flat plane. And that's how they steer yep. them. And that's, yep. that's the major reason. So Bob's uh, story about using the uh, element 115, which we've now discovered and, and proven, uh, as the primary source for energy bombarding the, the element with a, a beam of, I think he said neutrons, I forget now. But anyway, this produced electricity to drive the three anti-gravity mm, projectors. And mm-hmm. that's just not exactly the way it worked. But anyhow, um, maybe he didn't describe it properly, whatever. Um, so uh, I'll leave that as it is. Um, you know, I, I wasn't at Area 51, so I don't know that uh, he did or did not visit such a facility. Mm-hmm. I just have a caution mark by his name, that's all. Okay, okay. I was curious. Uh, Gordon Cooper, in his book, Leap of Faith, had, uh, met with... Um, Oh, what's his name? The German scientist, von Braun. Yep. Who he says told him that um, they had already developed, that the Nazis had already developed uh, flying discs that had propulsion systems, unlike anything that we knew about. What would be your take on that? Is this really a resurgence and coming in on paperclip and the importation of this kind of technology? I was pretty young when I met von Braun. We didn't talk about that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, it's possible. Uh, the Glockenspiel, you know, the Bell Project, where they were uh, apparently working with anti-gravity and, and mercury and recirculating it in these rings and stuff, um, that may have been the early stages of their experiment. Now, um, Hitler and his troops underneath him, his, his high staff, you know, the, the SS and whatever, they were all into the black arts. And uh, they would have definitely, you know, been trying to reach out to Satan or any alien spaceman or whatever they could contact to get the power they wanted to control the world. Yes. Um, so, yeah, they could have they could have accessed that technology. Now, where did it go? Um, some of it went to Russia. Some of it went to America and what they captured. But I think the the real prizes went to neither place. Um, the uh, it's a matter of record that Germany had already been down to the South Pole. This is public record, not, not any secrets. They'd been down there and they'd uh, found 
a place they called the Schwabenland, uh, after Schwabe, yes. or Schwabenland, okay. And it was a cavern underneath the ice. They could, they could go in by submarine. Now, whether Admiral, um, what's his name, um, oh, the polar explorer. Um, Bird? Bird, yeah. Whether Bird actually took the invasion force down there and got attacked by flying saucers from New Schwabenland and, and retreated or not, I don't know. I, I've read most of what's on the Internet, but I can't say that I can prove it. But it makes sense because we know the Germans are already there, and they a couple of them did disappear. A few of them disappeared with technology and submarines, got away. And, you know, they did surface in Argentina, and uh, that's close enough to get down to the pole. And they may have been developing stuff with alien help or follow-on help in the Schwabenland or similar type bases down there. Um, so I think that the the new world order will be a resurgence of national socialism, new Nazis. Well, that answers a good question for me because in some of the TV programs, and I don't remember which one it was, but they, they went to Mars, and as they were flying in and landing at this base, a Nazi flag was flying. And this was probably 15 <laughs> years ago that they had that. Well, that, that made me wonder. Uh, well, uh, alternative three, of course, is a little different. No, it was something about Battle for Earth or something like that. It was one of those sci-fi things. I would like to find it again because it, it made me just wonder, why would they plant a Nazi flag on a Martian base unless they were trying to tell you something? Well, it might have been very imaginative writers, too, but uh, I, I tend to think that we... Well, look, um, there's a lot of development in the space program, uh, and I was in part of that secret uh, program that has never made the light of day. And it's so compartmentalized that, you know, left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing half the time, but um, we are a lot further advanced in our knowledge of, of physics uh, under, you know, under this type of organization than the public realizes. Uh, so it, it, was it using German technology and German scientists? It very well could have been. Uh, there's just a lot of little tiny clues that would point that direction. So I don't know. So um, are they still operating out of Antarctica pretty much? I mean, it's you know, pretty isolated. I'm wondering if they're not moving their operations over into Saudi Arabia because that's going to be the main uh, base of operations of the Antichrist. Uh, look, they're going to appear to be good guys, and they're going to appear to arrive in time to save humanity from itself. Um, and they've got to have a leader who is not known, is not part of any major religion. He, he, uh, young Prince Solomon says he's a, um, a Muslim of sorts, uh, but, um, you know, let's face it, he's not really strict. Um, and the Pope is calling for a world religion where Islam and Christianity and Judaism and, and Buddhism and Jainism, all the rest of them, are all coming together into one thing. And the former Prime Minister of Israel, Shimon Peres, has met uh, in the last two years with the Pope, uh, endorsing and suggesting uh, methods of doing it to form a world religion. So the Antichrist being a Muslim is not going to be a, a detriment to him being accepted by an unbelieving world who doesn't know any better. So this young fellow this young Prince Solomon, you look it up, he, he's a handsome fellow. In fact, I've got his picture there on that show images page down about four rows down in the middle. He's got a you know, tea towel yes. on his head with a little yeah. thing yep. there. If you yep. click on that, you'll see another picture of him over in the page that follows um, um, down, down toward the bottom of it. But I've listed the things about him that start to look like he's the, the one spoken of by Daniel. Anyway... Um, and, and and the Pope, of course, is endorsing, the, saying that aliens can be baptized and be saved. Um, I love your this, picture. <laughs> isn't that good? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I had fun doing that one. Um, but, you know, it does tell what was in the news articles. Yeah, okay, y'all come. Uh, aliens are welcome. You can be saved, too. And you got the Pope, you know, the most major religion on the planet, uh, and he's saying, uh, you know, next to uh, Islam, I guess they're 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 gaining on us. But he's saying, look, uh, everyone's welcome. We'll we'll baptize the aliens, and here you have a an Arabic prince, um, uh, Muslim, 
saying, you know, okay, we want world peace, we want to do it this way, you know, uh, we want to get rid of ISIS. And that's another point. In 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 Daniel, I think it is, when the Antichrist comes to power, remember where yes. he says he'll come to power with a small people? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's not a country. That's not a country. It's a small people. And ISIS is not a country. It is a small people, and he will defeat them. And with the help of this small people, he will save the world, you know, in quotes, and become number one candidate for world leader. Hmm. He's he's making it quite obvious. He's trying to get rid of ISIS and Iran, but uh, you know, and 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 he may do it. He just may well do it. So, what is the connection? CIA, you know, you read all these articles that the CIA funded and actually created ISIS, and then we hear that they're sending the B fifty twos over there to bomb ISIS, and yet Putin and some of the other guys said, "Wait a minute, this is all just charade." They're just pretending to go after ISIS, and they're really not, which is one of the reasons Putin said he went in there in the first place. Yes, I don't think that what we're being fed in the press is the truth by any means. It's a long way from it. Um, smoke and mirrors out there. You know, an interesting thing about uh, Putin's move into Ukraine, uh, Putin is facing famine again in Russia, shortage of production. The eastern mm-hmm. side of Ukraine that he's he's uh, gone into is the breadbasket. Russia used to depend on it for a lot of its food. So food and energy and water, they're all top items. That's one of the reasons that I'm pretty sure that Putin moved in there. Well, I'll the tell you East. what, Stan. Yeah, I was just going to mention, Stan, that there are some scattered reports, intel out there, that say that Putin is preparing to go take more of the Ukraine on that side uh, yeah. than it's already taken, and so do you Do you expect that to begin to happen shortly? I do. I do. Now, okay. he's down in the Middle East. Uh, he's supporting um, Assad. Um, why? He needed to have a Middle East presence to a seaport in the Mediterranean and a number of other things, but since they've lost their presence when the Soviet Union disbanded, um, he wants to regain their strength in the area because of the oil fields. And, of course, uh, we know that the kings of the east will march in there after uh, the world, the the Arabs and whatever, have fought against Israel, and Israel's fought against them, and there's been a, a real melee down there in, in the Middle East. And when everybody's tired and spent all their weapons and you know, they're broke, the Chinese will just walk in. They'll march in from China over there to grab the oil fields, and that will be where the last big battle, the Battle of Armageddon, occurs. And why? Well, let, let me ask you something, Stan. Uh, you're familiar with Dan Gordon, are you not? Dan Gordon. I'm not sure. Uh, he, yeah, he's a good friend of uh, Richard Shaw and L.A. Marzulli. He's a uh, screenwriter on the West Coast. You know, he's also okay. an officer in the IDF Reserve. And I had interviewed him sometime oh, a few months ago uh, when they were having a lot of trouble with Gaza. And I asked Dan, I asked him very interesting questions, pretty pointed, but kind of interesting. And I got an unexpected answer. I, you know, I, when I asked Dan about what was Israel planning with a solution to stop a lot of this, you know, with Hezbollah and Hamas and and ever ISIS and all that surrounded them, and, you know, and you know what his answer was to me is very interesting. He said, Israel is playing for time. He said, we're playing for time. What do you think about that answer? It probably means that they have uh, got a method of defending themselves, and they're either wanting to get them into place or into production, finish it till they, where they have enough, or they're deploying them now to get ready to really surprise everyone. Look, the oh, world okay. is going to be afraid of Israel. They, they, they really are. And uh, they've got stuff they've been doing in the back room. I've, I've heard rumors of it about tactical nuclear uh, bombs that are more like neutron or real estate bombs, but they're tactical, smaller levels that could be launched on smaller missiles in the field. And they may have something even better than that. And when, the, when they are pressed into a conflict here shortly, they will use that, and it will be such a surprise and such a devastating thing to the enemy is why the, the, the nations of the world will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, okay, <laughs> time out. Let's make a, a covenant, <laughs> a peace treaty, okay? Uh, we, we believe you. And I think Israel is just about there. Uh, they've 
look, they they have to. They, if they don't, they they would might as well just lay down and die. They're yeah. being threatened on every side, not uh, subtly at all. I mean, uh, the there are a number of the Arab nations that want them to disappear, lay down, and die, go away. And uh, Israel is such a small country physically that they can't have the option of letting somebody do a first strike. They've got to make preemptive strikes or be ready to absolutely decimate any strike that comes their way. And I don't blame them. Well, I know Netanyahu was asked one time, not, well, maybe Larry could remember, but it was maybe two years ago, and they asked him, well, why are you preparing for all this, and who who do you perceive as your enemy? And he just replied, everybody. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I didn't hear that, but I can believe he said it. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's such a complex issue. There are so many factors that the guy that, uh, you know, negotiates this peace treaty uh, between uh, nations and cultures that have argued about ownership of land for several thousand years, this guy is going to be pretty much uh, the fair-haired darling of the world at that point because they'll say, who could solve such a you know an incredible dilemma? between, you know, the Arabs and the Israelis and the Jews and the Muslims in the Middle East. Yeah. It, Almost it, makes you uh, think of Lawrence of Arabia, only in yeah. a modern sense. You know, that was T.E. That, that uh, e. Lawrence. He was a writer as well. Yes. And, you know, when he was with the Bedouins over there uh, as Lawrence of Arabia, one of the things he did uh, get wind of and, and tried to track it down was a city called the um, lost Atlantis of the Sands. I oh, was very really? close to finding it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You look it up. Look up T.E. Lawrence or Lawrence Arabia and Atlantis of the Sands. Wow. So he knew, or they knew, probably. And uh, it's sad he got killed in that uh, motorbike accident uh, after he got back to England. But um, uh, he was onto something there. Uh, and there was also mm. a great river, a missing river. And of course, we can see that now in the in the NASA images, satellite images. But um, he was going just to what the Bedouins had in the rumor market. And as I said earlier in the show, the Bedouins talk about who made all these, you know, the the, the mystical or, or lost city of the Atlantis of the Sands, and who made all these stone formations, you know, long straight lines and circles at the end of it, and a circle in the middle of that, and was the the old men, the men of the old race, and and they'll tell you about that. So, you know, it's right there in front of us. Just kind of got to connect the dots. And what what's interesting, yeah. Stan, too, is is some recent, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know whether archaeologists or what uh, that have claimed that uh, the a lot of the damage on the pyramids is water damage, and have yeah. been laughed out of the saddle. But they're not that. Yeah, that that wrong far wrong are they? No, absolutely not. I'm sure it's water damage. The, the flood did occur, you know, and it was a surge tidal wave, and it ricocheted back and forth for weeks. But um, and, and it persisted in that area, even though uh, you know some of the Egyptians did survive. They recorded that um, it took what a year or so. They record something like that for the the waters to go down, but the whole Saudi. The peninsula was a mud bath. It was just sludge. And uh, they even told the Greeks, you know, Plato's uh, uncle or grandfather, Herodotus, he said, you know, look, and Solon, sorry, Solon, he said, uh, you know, when you Greeks were just crawling up out of the mud of the flood. Um, so it, it did happen over there, and uh, I'm sure the Sphinx and the pyramids had water damage. Well, I know that Dr. Schock from Boston University really caught it for going over there and, and verifying that. And they, they all but destroyed his reputation, or attempted to anyway. I and, know. and that's the uh, odd part about some of this. Are they so entrenched in their thinking that they just can't open up their minds to alternatives? Most of these people who are so dead set in their ways are funded by uh, patrons like uh, oh, kings and queens okay. and presidents and whatever, and they don't want to lose their funding. But behind the scenes, they are interested in this. Like, uh, I got a call in Australia at home from uh, a friend of um, Prince Charles's dad, the the, the um, uh, Duke of um, Edinburgh. 
And um, they had a copy of my book, uh, The Cosmic Conspiracy. They had that picture on the front with the pyramid and the eye and stuff. And, all that. and they yes. called me and said, look, uh, we're organizing an ex- expedition, an archaeological one, over to Egypt to join a woman who's already uh, on our payroll who has discovered what we think is Alexander's missing tomb. And on the front stone of it, inside, you know, in this, ca- in this um, cavern or uh, chamber, is something from the front cover of your book. And so would you be interested in joining the expedition? And of course, my answer was, oh, yeah, 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 you got my number. And it <laughs> never happened. But that tells you that the royal family even was looking seriously at um, uh, at Alexander the Great being buried there and at previous flood damage to that area that was in the, 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 the flooding of this uh, chamber they were talking about. They had to drain the chamber from the old flood. So it, it, behind the scenes... They talk about this stuff. They do it, but they don't want to put it out to the public uh, because it's just too volatile as far as uh, shaking religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, or whatever. And they want the herd, that's us, to be calm and controlled and go through the gates that they point us to. Mm-hmm. And I, they've They're done a very it. good job, actually. You know what's going to be cool, though, guys? Uh, it's like when... A, general is fighting with the country he's going to take it over he gets spies within there that are people that that are part of the culture he's attacking and saying look come and help us you know to overthrow your government and uh, you know we'll give you a good position when we take over the country these are traitors so as soon as the general takes over the country and wins he finds all of these uh, spies who were traitors lines them up against the wall and kills them because you can't trust them <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. It happened in the Russian Revolution as well. So, what happens to the Illuminati, who are traitors to us, when the Antichrist takes over and he wants to win the support of the people that know that they're a bunch of bad dudes at the top that have been manipulating us? He's going to destroy the Illuminati. Yeah. I, I had a, a lieutenant commander when I was uh, flying professionally. And we right. were flying one night, and he looked over. He, this was something he volunteered. I didn't even ask him about it at all. But you know when you get up there at 40,000 feet, and you just kind of point the airplane, and you're, it's mesmerizing, particularly at night. Anyway, he looked yeah. over, and he said, i got something I want to tell you. And I said, well, what's that, Ed? And he said, uh, there was a mother ship. He said, this UFO stuff is real. And he said there was a base down in, um, I don't know if it was New Mexico, somewhere, where a mothership landed, and I, he was an eyewitness to it. I guess he flew in material and men and everything, and it was an abandoned base, he said. And they set it up for this arrival. And he said big SUVs and Cadillacs and that sort of thing all arrived and they were high-level military, high-level civilians. They got on board this mothership. They, he said they were in there for about five hours. And then they all got on, off board, and uh, the UFO just took off and went into the heavens. What would you would you comment on that? Is this part of this overall Eisenhower treaty or treaties that they're working out? Do you think? You mean in the early fifties? When I, when I sorry when Eisenhower was president, you mean, or German? Yeah. Which one, Eisenhower? Okay. I think it would be Ike. Yeah, that he was um, probably referring to. Yeah, Ike disappeared for a few hours uh, over in California one time, and in Secret Service nobody else could find him. That's why he was in office as president. And uh, rumor has it that he was taken to meet with alien beings at the time. That that may have been part of that uh, mothership thing you're talking about. As far as um, you know, deserted bases or whatever in Arizona. You, you're talking Arizona or New Mexico? New Mexico, isn't it? I think it was New Mexico, but he, yeah. you know, there's, he might there's have changed large, the location, too. Well, yeah, yeah, probably for good reason. But uh, there is a large area, like a, a large uh, crater, I mean huge, uh, up near Los Alamos in the upper part, uh, northern part, northwestern part of uh, New Mexico. Um, oh. And there's a lot of places in there that would be prime uh, landing for something like that. The the fact that they were in there for five hours, the people visiting the ship, that's five hours of our time. If they had a, a hmm. very dense field in there, they could have spent days and weeks in there being trained or programmed or whatever, or rewarded well, or, you know, 
all kinds of stuff. So anyway, oh. with that, um, such a thing uh, would be in keeping with the rumors that I heard uh, while I was in there about us meeting with them in various places, uh, humans rather when I say us. Um, the head of our project here in the United States uh, was Dr. Um, Edward Teller. His counterpart in Russia, believe it or not, we were working with Russians on this, was Dr. Andrei Sakharov, a Nobel Prize winner and leading physicist there. Uh, the Russians got a bit thingy about him participating in this with the United States, and so they kind of restricted him to uh, Russia. He couldn't come out to some of the meetings and stuff. But um, this was a global uh, consortium of scientists and capitalists, you know, or like uh, financiers and bankers and industrialists. The scientists are more or less after pure science. The industrialists, uh, the bankers, they were after power, control, order. Um, the you know, same old game. But uh, uh, I did hear from well, was a pilot in California in one of the smaller airports outside Los Angeles. What was it? Was it Burbank? Anyway, he was on duty, and there was a metal hangar there, and uh, he was supposed to guard it. Uh, some muck mucks had come in from the eastern states, apparently, and there was Cadillacs and stuff waiting for him, and they drove off. And so he was guarding the, the hangar and went inside. And in there was a small, like, um, it wasn't even a saucer-shaped craft, but it was a, an electromagnetic craft that had, like, a leather paneling, you know, leather seats, you know, and uh, all the luxury mod cons for the rich and famous to use when they get in their little buggy and transport from New York to California in the blink of an eye. He said the thing kind of was sitting there on the ground but not really touching it. He said uh, it was really nicely outfitted. It was like a, the Cadillac of flying saucers. And I I wasn't sure whether to believe him or not, but doggone the guy, he, he, was, he was straight serious and a security guy. So anyway, that's just another little piece of information you can throw out there to add to all the rest. There he yeah, Ed, they well, Ed it. was a very, very, uh, how do I say, very straightforward, very honest guy, and it just felt to me like he wanted, he died soon after. It was almost like he just wanted to get something off his chest yeah. that, he, that he knew. Yeah, and, I can uh, see You know, it you was know one time, time I was, sorry, I was going to say, that, that reminds me a little bit of that movie Close Encounters with Richard Dreyfuss years ago. Yeah. Uh, that type of incident yeah. and that strange mountain, you know, at, which uh, I guess the Four Corners region would be the, where that would be, wouldn't it? Well, the movie was shot, I think, uh, in Wyoming or Montana. There's a, that, that mountain is there, that uh, strange peak thing. But um, where it was, uh, what they were trying to relate it to might well have been in, in uh, New Mexico, I mean, down the Four Corners region. That's where that, that portion is, right, at the Four Corners. Hmm. Uh yeah, I was on a, uh, a flight to, um, where were we going to, to Paris, uh, out of New York with a film crew that were, we were filming a, a documentary when I still lived in Australia. And um, we were the guests of the Yugoslav government. And um, but for that particular leg of the flight, we were with um, French UTA Airlines. And uh, so a long flight over the North Atlantic, and I went up at night and uh, talked to the captain and stuff and the co-pilot and we sat there jawing a bit and I asked him, you know, you guys ever see any um, UFO type things or flying saucers? And they looked at each other and said, why? And I said, oh, that's what we're, we're investigating, Nikola Tesla's work and flying saucers. And I said, I used to work on a project where we uh, designed them. And the pilots both said, okay, here's what we saw. <laughs> And we had a really good jaw session, and we were approaching the airport there in Paris. And the co-pilot says, okay, should I do it now? To the pilot, he said, yeah, you better. He reached up, and he pushed the race button on the flight recorder in the cabin. So, huh. they, <laughs> Well, I know that's true, because I flew for many, many years professionally. And we had, uh, in our flight manuals, we had a number of pages on what to report when you saw a UFO. Nobody would ever report it unless they absolutely had to. They just yeah. wouldn't. I know. I know. Well, Stuart, yeah, and, and, and Larry, we live in a time where we're going to get to see a lot of this fulfilled prophecy. We're here in this generation. Amazing. Mm-hmm. 
What would your uh, comment be on what, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dr. Peter Benito. He's dead now. But he claimed to be an insider. And he talked about Russian, what he called cosmospheres. They were like shaped like a cow magnet, only they were huge, anti-gravity devices. Have you heard um, about anything of that nature? Uh, let me just think a minute. A horseshoe shape, right? Well, we said like a- uh, some of them were, and then some of them were just like a long gated tube. Almost like a cruise missile, but rounded on both ends. Like I remember his name. I remember yeah. uh, Dr. Peter's name. <clears throat> and the the interesting thing that you just said, uh, uh, this horseshoe shape, I found a number of these in stone formations in Saudi Arabia on the ground when I was over there searching uh, with the, the digital maps. Um, wow. I'm wondering. <laughs> That's incredible. Anyway. Uh, what did he say, uh, uh, other than the political agenda of the global elite? Did he say uh, things about the um, the flying saucer issues or what? Oh, yeah. He said that uh, <clears throat> we had huge uh, cosmospheres, and that they were operating between the Earth, Mars, and the moon. He, he died some time ago. And he also talked about a um, cloning and that you were never really sure if you were seeing a world leader or his clone. He also mentioned what he called the War of the Harvest Moon, Mm. and that we lost that war to the Soviets. Ah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I I do. uh, It's been so long. He he died back in the late 80s, I think, sometime. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you guys have seen a, one of the reports lately from the I, the International Space Station or not. Uh, I think Stuart, I sent you a copy of it the other day. Some UFO activity where the, their horseshoe uh, object was a huge one was uh, photographed from the ISS station and it set off NASA. And now they got a problem with uh, the media about that because some pictures were yeah, they, released. It was a horseshoe. Why a horseshoe? It was a, hor- a huge horseshoe. You might want to look at it, Stan, if you haven't seen it. Where, where did you uh, find it? It's still that on YouTube. On YouTube. Where you can find it, Stan, you can also find it at uh, Scott Waring's site, which is, uh, if you can go there real quick, to uh, ufosightingsdaily.com. UFO sightings, plural, daily.com. Uh, okay, I'm there now. There. Yeah, I'm there now. Yeah, it's there too. There or two ago, the ISS images captured it. Uh, all right, I'm looking through the images. Uh, I see a cow at the moment upside down and being supported by beams. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll look at that later. I won't hold you up on air about that. But So it was a, oh, yeah, Is that must be a theory. Yes. Oh, no, that was on the moon. Okay. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, oh, that's okay. So it's, uh, he's got a He's got an incredible site. I, I should have sent you a copy, Stan. I sent, I forwarded it to Stuart because it was it, they uh, uh, entitled it as a as a uh, huge horseshoe shaped object came close to the ISS and ISS images were captured and that, it got out and NASA's trying to cover it up now. Dang! Well, uh, is, it on the, is it on his page still? Do you know or? Well, it probably would be. I can forward. The, I've got it captured. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, if you go to my, I think I put it on my blog, I think, one of them. Go to my blog site, LarryWTyler.org, and scroll down in the images, and a day or so ago is when I posted that, uh, a couple of images there. I'm just doing it. Uh, yeah, it's huge, and it is you. It is horseshoe-shaped. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know about horseshoe craft, uh, Stan, until you talked about it in Saudi Arabia. I never had a. I didn't know a connection there. Okay, so your site, your blog site, is Larry Taylor what dot org? No, oh, Larry W. The initial W Taylor dot org. Larry W Taylor dot org. Okay, all right, I'm there now. And, and uh, scroll down <laughs> just a little ways through a couple of days there, and you'll see it. It's uh, day before yesterday, I believe. I posted it on one of the. Oh, it's got a circle around, a red circle around it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I see that there. 
dang, that's big. I mean, relative to the... Uh, well, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, you know, look, I, I expect a lot of this stuff to become very public knowledge and mainstream more and more as we get to that crisis point that's going to make people cry out for that new world leader. Um, mm-hmm. Remember, and, um, basically, uh, Hitler didn't take over Germany. He became, he came there to save the, the common man and from the bankers, industrialists, you know, the Illuminists that were squeezing the life out of him. And so people supported him because he turned yep. things to, in the short term to good, you know, uh, employment and all that kind of stuff and getting rid of all the baddies. So now we're at that point again where something has to, you know, solve the world's problems, the threats of you know, near-Earth objects you know, colliding with the planet and energy shortages and famine and water and economy. I mean, you know, the threat of nuclear war. All these things are going to come to a head in the media, I think probably before the real damage from these things happen, so that people can be herded underneath, you know, this world leader to in time to avert these things but still be under the control of, the, uh, of Satan and his minions, not the Illuminati so much. I think they're their history they're gone they just don't know it yet huh yeah Yeah, that's sort of like the x-files where the rich guys go into the hangar uh, that they're invited into this big hangar and the aliens that they've been dealing with come in and kill them all yeah absolutely that's that's i believe (laughs) that Uh, that's that's what it's going to be like and i sometimes wonder if we're not getting some uh, good intelligence um in the form of sci-fi like uh you know, the X-Files. Yeah, I think the, if you really follow, I've got all of them, and if you really follow and study them, they revealed an awful lot of things. But they're yeah. doing it as fiction. So, you know, they can say to the human race, well, we showed you, you know, you just didn't figure it out. Yeah. So, anyway, getting yeah. back to this impact event, we kind of wandered yep. off that. Oh, okay, sorry. Did that yep. Then, oh, no problem. But did that then expand the planet? Um, yes. Uh, the planet would have expanded anyway without that, but this accelerated the process. If you'll notice, as mm, as stellar systems uh, age, they increase in diameter. Uh, it's like they're slowing down their spin like a bubble, and then the bubble bursts, and it becomes just background dark matter or whatever. Galaxies expand as they age and slow down. Planets are wound up in the beginning. They are really tightly wound and, and compact little balls, or big balls in the case of the gas giants. But as they age, they their diameter gets bigger, and it may be indiscreet, like quanta, discrete uh, levels uh, of uh, expansion, where they don't gradually expand, they expand, and then they stop, and they radiate energy, and they spin energy slows a bit, and suddenly, there's the next one, and over a period of a year or two or whatever, it expands to the new diameter. Um, I have to get this dead gum paper illustrated out for people to understand what gravity is. It's not a one-directional force, and it's what causes planets to... um, to be uh, expanding as they age. Um, Gravity reverses its direction here on Earth, as it does in many other uh, stellar objects. It reverses its direction as you approach from the surface of the object down toward the core, and gravity is backwards before you get to the core. Um, uh, Anyway, uh, getting a little bit off the subject, uh, yes, uh, the Earth impact of the Earth with that meteor did accelerate this process, and in the process, that's what broke the landmass that was in, surrounded by the ocean uh, into the continents we have today. Yeah, and in the process of hitting the planet against the spin, as you can see from the graph or the image I made there, mm-hmm. they put up a crater, mm-hmm. uh, it took energy out of the spin of the Earth and accelerated its demise in a, in a normal thing. The stars, when they're aging, you'll see they'll go to the red giant stage where suddenly, not gradually, suddenly, phew, They'll expand to the red giant stage as they age, and we're the same. And if you, if I could just kind of wave my hand and do it, I, I would for you to show you how these um, vortexual spinning fields in the fluid of space and dark matter organize matter. I'll tell you what, it's like this. It's like this. Take a glass of, of clear water and um, 
a little bit of black uh, sand and um, a little bit of, um, oh, I don't know, um, uh, something else that doesn't dissolve, like uh, mm, uh, mm, less dense white sand. we got mm-hmm. light sand, and we got heavier dark sand, and we stir them up in the water, and you'll see that they spin around up in the air into a funnel, and you know, then they start to recirculate around the edge of the glass and down toward the bottom. As the spin slows down, it leaves a kind of a pile, a pointy pile down at the bottom of the glass of all these things. But the more dense things, the black ones come out first, and the next come the lighter things, like with Earth. Um, and if that's basically how this yeah. field works. Um, and as it slows down, uh, instead of having a glass, you have the the, the mass sea of uh, dark energy out around it, and that acts as a reflector uh, of the spin, and it organizes mass into these shells, and uh, that's why we have, in the case of the, uh, say, the uh, the sun, where we have uh, the shift of the magnetic poles of the sun every 22 years, it's called the hail magnetic cycle. When the north pole of the sun starts to flip and become a south pole, you would think, naturally, that at the same time, the south pole of the sun would flip and become a north pole, right? Not so. This last solar cycle, they notice, oh, wow, the North Pole flipped and became South three or four weeks before the South Pole flipped to become a North. So at that point in time, they had two South Poles. And then they find out, uh, and this is some time back, but they uh, related to what NASA had done with the supercomputers, they modeled our North and South Poles for when we have a magnetic pole reversal here, like with the Sun. And surprise, surprise, they found out hey, when they start to flip our poles, we'll have a north-south magnetic pole in the northern hemisphere, and we'll have another north-south magnetic pole in the southern hemisphere, (laughs) and we might even have a third one running around in there. And when you look at the models they've got on their site, you can see how that would create a lot of bumps and bulges and and havoc inside the planet when you have these pairs of poles floating around. Same thing with the sun. So, yeah. So then with this... Are we getting the warnings of an impending not only pole shift but possible crustal shift because of this? Uh, uh, well, you got the north, uh, you got the Atlantic anomaly, and you've got some things that are really starting to show up magnetically that they're concerned about. It would, is this a forewarning? Is this a, of what's coming? Well, maybe. Um, you know. Uh, the, the the surface of the Earth that we know is, as you know, uh, Stuart, uh, and there is a thin uh, layer uh, which floats on top of the magma and various other layers all the way down to the core of the planet. And you might think that if you uh, put the brakes on the surface of the Earth spinning, just suddenly put a hand out and stopped it, that gravity would stop. But it doesn't. Um, gravity is generated by this field that penetrates all the mass and organizes it. Uh, so in the Bible, when the Earth changed its attitude and the sun didn't move, you know, it stayed in the sky for a day and a half, two days, whatever, uh, mm-hmm. that was not making the the gravity uh, disappear, which some guys said would happen, because the centrifugal force of the spinning Earth is so minute compared to the gravitational force that it didn't affect it. Um, mm-hmm. We may be seeing something like this. I mean, what are we seeing here? We, we're seeing earthquakes increasing. We're seeing volcanoes increasing. Uh, it take Oklahoma City in the last uh, three years, the earthquake rate there has improved or increased by 800% in three years. Um, the west west side of the Ring of Fire in the Pacific is very busy right now, right as we speak, increasing in density and, and, and uh, magnitude. Um, and the Bible does say that there will be in the last days uh, a great earthquake, so great that you know man has never seen it. Uh, this is going to involve all the continents of the planet, and we can see the fault lines that connect everything now. Uh, will that cause a shift in the uh, crustal structure? I mean, earthquakes of only Richter 9 have caused the Earth to slow down a few fractions of a second and spin. So at the right place in time, yeah, it could. So is the, uh, are the sinkholes and the rifts that are now developing, is this all part of this expansion? I think so, uh, but in defense of what they're saying, they say it's water leaks and things like that, and that's probably mm-hmm. true. Uh, you have uh, water pipes and, and uh, river flows or, or, or 
pools of water that are trapped underneath the surface of the earth under where these sinkholes appear. But the pipes don't break until the land starts to spread apart, and then the water eats out a hole underneath that, and you have a sinkhole. Um, so it's the fluids and things that are there in contained uh, pipes or formations that do the damage, but it's because of the stretching of the surface. And sinkholes aren't egg-shaped. They're round. It's an equal stretching on all sides as the, the, the planet, the sphere, expands. Hmm. Now, if you were to stop the rotation, let's say we have a passing space body and it slows down or stops the rotation, that, well, wouldn't that cause just tremendous tsunamis and everything? And besides, What are you thinking? You're running the planet X? Yeah, if there is such a thing. But it looks like there is. They're photographing a lot of stuff, but is it real? Yeah. A uh, lot of the photographs, fact, all the photographs that have been shown to me, I can explain as artifacts of the lens and uh, cloud formations and reflected uh, like uh, mirages on the horizon. They, they all involve the sun somewhere in the picture in the front of the camera, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's that's a concern. But um, as far as planet X, the I mean, even NASA has been looking for this missing 10th planet, uh, X in Roman numerals is 10. And I've done the sums uh, some time ago uh, looking for uh, where the next stable orbit around our sun would be if there were this missing planet. And I think I found it at, uh, let's see, about 75 times the distance of Earth from the sun that there is a stable orbit there. And if that orbit were long and egg-shaped, that the sun would be one side of the egg orbit and the there'd be another invisible spot out there somewhere between um, uh, 75 times the distance of the Earth and the Sun, and it would it would orbit around those. And strangely enough, when I looked at that stable orbit, it is an orbit that is within a margin of error of, you know, plus or minus about uh, 10, 15 years. It's 3,600 years long. But the 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 planet, if it's there, does not travel at a uniform speed in that long egg-shaped orbit. As it gets closer to the sun, it goes faster, 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 faster. And mm -hmm. uh, by my calculations, it could come into the inner planets and go around the sun. In other words, not coming close to planets so much as going around the sun. And it could make the traverse in and out of the inner solar system in less than 11 years. I don't think you would ever see it at this point coming so close to the Earth that we could sit there with the naked eye and say, oh, look, it's in the sky. It's, it's causing tidal waves. What it can do and may be doing is because the orbits of planets are relying upon a fluid, you know, the dark matter fluid that, that forms star systems and planets by its spin, uh -huh. Uh -huh. it could be interrupting, say, our orbit and other planets' orbits, not even coming close to the planet, but its, its own fluid orbit impinges upon ours and the sun, which then impinges on our orbit as well. And that could be causing things like the Earth may be going a little bit closer to the sun or a little bit further away, of, you know, a fraction of a percent this way or that way, heating up and cooling down. As a result of this thing passing, you know, a long way from us, but still around the sun and through our orbital paths or close to them. Um, and it doesn't need to come so close you can see it to do the damage. Uh, so school's still out for me. I'm, I'm still waiting to see, you know, what I consider to be reliable proof of that. But... Uh, there's just a lot of historical evidence to say that something uh, has come uh, around the Earth, uh, whether it be a comet, whether it be Venus jumping orbit uh, into where it is now. Velikovsky covered that. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just a lot of evidence to say that something like that did happen. And because of this compressed time of the age of the universe, I think that uh, it wasn't that long ago. It may happen again. No, well, Stan, also, you're, you're also, too, there's some reports that... Uh, here in the last week or so, that uh, NASA is saying uh, Mars is brightening. And, and I think, haven't we heard that either Saturn or one of the other planets has, has had a brightening process begun on it? Kind of weird, but they say, they say that. Well, haven't they also said that they've noticed that the temperature of the planets, many of the other planets, is rising? That's right. That's because all right. those SUVs out there. That's it, and the cow herds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it's just a guess. Probably, according to the UN, that would be the way it is. But 
Yeah, it it, uh, it is amazing because now you're familiar with the Hopi. In fact, you've worked with them, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Dan? Yes, I what, have. What's your take on the blue and red uh, Katrinas or whatever they call them? Katrinas. Um, the red Katrina, yeah, the red Katrina is representative of a um, a figure that's going to come into North America, and I, as I recall, the uh, it's an individual, and he might be wearing a red cape, and they say that he will signal the the, the be- beginning of an evil one coming in and invading the North America, and then will leave. The blue Kachina is like a star, you know, in the heavens, as opposed to a, a person here on Earth. Um, and it will signal a, a point in time where all these Earth changes that we've been talking about uh, for the end of this age of man. And let's see, I think this is the fourth age ending that they're talking about, that it will signal that end. And at that time, a house in orbit around the Earth, a house in the heavens, will fall to Earth and crash, which is probably the ISS. Um, it's been a while since I talked to the boys down there, but uh, that was basically, as I remember, what we talked about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, some people on the uh, on the web are combining that with, uh, I guess you'd have to call it planetoids that are running around this uh, brown dwarf, whatever it is, that's inbound or coming inbound or they think is inbound, whatever. And yeah, they're trying. Yeah. Yeah, they were trying to combine those things together. Look, Stuart, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I try to be honest about it. If I, if I had proof one way or the other about the the, the uh, little moons that, or planetoids, or whatever, orbiting that dark star and stuff, yeah, I'd say, oh yes, that that's doing it or that could do it. I just, uh, I like to have images yeah. or, or, you know, well, if and you don't so have I, proof, I were, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I don't want to mislead people, and you know, you and Larry and myself and Tom Horn, a lot of other people working on this kind of stuff. We have a responsibility because people depend on us to to give them the straight stuff as best we can, to to get proof of these things. And this area, this Planet X thing, is it, just a mystery to me. I, I I've given you the calculations I've done here just now, and there certainly is a stable orbit at 3,600 uh, years, plus or minus about 10 years. Uh, that does exist around the sun at this point in time. Is it getting longer because the solar system is expanding? Because my figures show 3,612 years rather than 3,600. I don't know. But certainly the physics say we could have something in orbit out there. And the the orbits of Neptune and Uranus and Pluto have been, uh, more Uranus and Neptune have been crushed, been pushed in a bit, uh, as though some massive object out there its orbit is periodically causing the uh, Neptune and, and Uranus to get closer to the sun than they should in a normal orbit. Um, mm-hmm. That tells us there's something out there. I mean, it's no secret. NASA's been looking for it for a long time, and they may have already found it. But uh, will it? does its orbit take it down into the inner planets or close around the sun like a comet would do, or is it going to stay out there in a kind of um, egg-shaped orbit, out, you know, uh, mm-hmm. What would that be? About uh, 75 times the distance to Earth, uh, yeah, on average, uh, away from the sun. 75 AUs, they call that. But um, I don't know. I don't know. There, there's just evidence of something there, and uh, we can't see it. Is it because you need an infrared telescope in orbit, uh, which no one can afford except the government? And so you're at their mercy to tell you? Uh, I don't know. You can wait a long All time. All part of the viewer. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you familiar with Dr. Paul LaViolette? Uh, yes, I remember the name, and I remember something about his work. It's been, oh gosh, a long time. Uh, well, he wrote a book. He wrote a book called uh, "Earth Under Fire," and he went into all the ancient uh, sayings and whatnot, and related it as not myth, but actually scientific, factual stuff that they were just trying to convey to the last generation. Very, very interesting book. If you haven't read it, you might want to grab a copy of it. It's it's called Earth Under Fire. I'm and looking at his website Paul now. Pilot. Yeah. Say again? I see, it. I see it. Gravity Waves Quadruple Gravity. Yeah, it looks like a very uh, erudite uh, book here. That's good. Yeah, I'll, uh, 
Uh, in fact, where did I... Uh, years ago, we were doing something in Australia with... The violet was in our research notes. Anyway, I'll, I'll look it up. I want to take your time to, to talk about it, but I'll, I'll look it up. I'm just saving the website now. Yeah, um, his his uh, findings were more like the man concepts that the black hole at the center of the Milky Way actually controls a lot of the life and the ages here on Earth. And that the, that is what the Mayans were trying to uh, convey to us as, as latter, you know, with their calendars and whatnot, that the actual end of the age wasn't an end of the age. It was just yeah. transferring into another one. Yeah, it's not the end of all time. It's just, you know, a transition state, yeah. Um, yeah, and as far as I know, the the current wisdom in mainstream physics is that uh, every galaxy has a black hole in the center of it. Now, what they used to say was that the black holes suck in everything and nothing gets out. Now they've revised that and saying, well, that's not exactly true because periodically galaxies start to emit strong radiation from the north and south pole of its rotation out to the poles of the galaxy, and that's energy coming out of the dark hole in a different form and much more concentrated, much more energetic, but going away from the whole system. So we're now seeing our Milky Way, our, dark, our, our, our black hole, start to open up and emit particles in the north and south vectors of our galaxy. These things could certainly affect the entire galaxy, and, you know, uh, with waves and particles, and that might be why the Mayans say that there are ages uh, to, you know, uh, a galaxy, you know, uh, discrete quantum ages, like the, the, the Brahmins do, you know, for the Brahma sleeps, Brahma wakes, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, we're we're going to unlock, and in, in, in Daniel, I think it does say that, you know, we travel to and fro, and wisdom just, increases by leaps and bounds just before the end. So yes. we are yes. unlocking stuff. Yeah. Well, Larry, and got any know, other thing? We're, we're down to about three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, Stan, Stan, one thing, uh, I know the listeners would like to know, have your opinion on where is these earthquakes taking us, uh, like the ones in Japan that are ongoing and the ones off Ecuador that's ongoing that has really captivated the news lately, or what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing at the moment what I would uh, consider to be a flurry of um, Richter 5, 5.5, and above earthquakes on the western and southeastern portion of the ring of fire or the arc of fire more appropriately. If you look at that show images page on the second row middle image, it's the first test image I put up uh, last uh, Friday night, I think it was, showing um, uh, Japan. And I, I found anomalies in this new method I'm using to predict earthquakes, which definitely mm. do show that there is a developing fault line uh, pressure, uh, you know, seismic pressure from the South Islands area at Kyushu, moving right up toward Fukushima. And there's a yellow circle oh. around Fukushima, and something else other than earthquakes. I predicted we would have one. Certainly, we had a 5.8 uh, last night or this morning where I thought they would as a part of an aftershock to the 2011 uh, earthquakes that hit the reactors. But look at it. If you can see that image I've got there, there's a big black neutral temperature area off Fukushima, oh. and then a second and a third one going out into the ocean. They go all the way up and toward the Aleutians. Is this water temperature being altered by radiation in the water from Fukushima? I don't know. Oh. I've never seen anything like it before. Wow. Anyway... We're going to have some excitement here um, this year. I think we're going to see more earthquakes, and I'm hoping we don't see the massive one over in the northwest area in the Juan de Fuca or the San Andreas. But I suppose we put that on the possibility of this because it's been extremely quiet there while everything else on the Arc of Fire has been releasing massive quakes. Yep. That's right. Oh. Well, and, and Stan, how can people uh, oh, reach oh, you? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just uh, at the bottom of the show images page, or sorry, at the bottom of our website, standeo.com, we have our contact emails, Holly and I, at the very bottom of the page. And if you don't want to go there, just look up standeo at standeo.com. And uh, we get a lot of emails from folks on their uh, phones and, and other things off the mobile site. But uh, we try to answer those that we can and those that are too difficult, well, we don't. So we're here. Larry? How do they reach you? 
Oh, it's very easy, LarryWTaylor.org. That's a blog site. You can follow me there, LarryWTaylor.org. Stan, this has been really, really uh, all I can say. This has yeah. been good. Thank you. <laughs> been fun, hasn't it, guys? Discovery. Yeah, it's been a great show. We have to have you back sometime when you're not as busy. Anyway, thanks a lot for coming on, and we certainly appreciate it. I have to say good night now to everybody. Thank you. Lord bless you. Bye bye. Yep. We'll see you later. Thanks for coming on. <laughs>